This is Fizz Free. In this episode, we meet Fizz Free co-host Claire. You know me and a glass of wine. That's never going to happen. A working mother based in the UK who quit drinking in the summer of 2021. My husband turned and looked at me like I'd gone a little bit crazy. I don't think he ever <laughs> expected those words to come out of my mouth. Claire's relationship with alcohol began to change through her work in an industry where drinking was highly normalised and glamorous. The only way to have the best fun looking at them was to get absolutely smashed. And I was a little bit envious of them having such a good time. Once parenthood arrived and then the pandemic, Claire realised her relationship with alcohol had become unhealthy. The pavement just felt like it was bouncing. And I'm just like, this is a Monday morning. I was really angry at myself because yet again, I'd put myself in that position. She opens up to Ruth and Jane about key moments in her journey, admitting she never once considered becoming sober. I never thought that that was going to be the case. I only ever thought I will learn to moderate one day. Claire shares the benefits she's experienced from stepping away from alcohol and what life's been like since. I achieve something every day by not drinking. Things started to matter to me again and the old me is coming back to life and coming back with a vengeance. Thanks for listening. This is Fizz Free. I'm Claire and I just wanted to tell you my story from sort of start to finish really. I've had a real good think today over where it all started and I think probably I never really drank copious amounts until about sort of 2006, 2007. I was working in the corporate hospitality industry in my 20s um, doing events mainly for middle-aged blokes that I worked with and they wanted to host events for their clients within the mortgage industry, mainly in the UK but sometimes abroad as well. Things like having events with Girls Aloud and Scott Mills, which in your 20s was just absolutely amazing. And I think I was quite impressionable at that age, as we are. And I was sat around in meetings with, you know, guys that were made me realise that actually they were so strategic, so knowledgeable, um, really brought me back down to earth, the saying that your parents say, oh, you know, you think you know everything and you know nothing. And I sat in those meetings realising that I actually did know nothing. And I was flung into this um, situation whereby I kind of had to wing it and pull off these events, which I did do eventually. But those events really were insightful to me because I noticed that these really intelligent people were going to these events and it was all about getting absolutely hammered. So you saw these highly intelligent, highly functioning guys and they were premeditated. It was premeditated that they were going to get absolutely smashed and they would laugh about it beforehand they would you know joke with each other they would talk about it for weeks after who got the most smashed and it was a complete new world for me and I think I kind of just thought the only way to have the best fun looking at them was to get absolutely smashed and they looked like they was having an absolute whale of a time and they sounded afterwards so I think I saw that and because when I was doing the events I was actually um, sober because I had to be from start to finish and I was a little bit envious of them having you know the freedom having such a good time that it was so allowed you know the hierarchy allowed them and thought it was like almost compulsory really to get absolutely 
you know, off your rocker. Um, and I think that really left an impression and it was just laughed about, laughed about that, you know, and some of the time it, it was really damaging because the decisions that they made under the influence, you know, it was going to be affecting, if anything got leaked, I suppose, for want of a better word, you know, it could potentially affect their home lives as well. So they were making decisions, doing things with people that they shouldn't be doing things with. Um, and that, again, when I think about it now, it really pranged. I'm fortunate enough to come from a family where those morals are kind of, you know, so integral to our structure. And it kind of blew my mind a little bit, really. I think I saw it as a much more integral part of life than I ever had before. It just didn't really feature hugely. My mum and dad have never been big drinkers really so you know Christmas would feature some alcohol or you know maybe a Friday night but it was a glass really it wasn't anything anything major so when I'm looking back and thinking about where it all started it was definitely then and I think it was all encompassing as well the whole event would revolve around and the talk in the office was revolving around and I think, yeah, I started, you know, joining in with that. And I think I wanted a part of it because they just looked like they were having such... I mean, I shouldn't have done, really, because obviously, again, I'm looking at them thinking they're not making the best decisions. Do you know what I mean? I think age has got a, a massive part to play in that, haven't I? You know, I suppose I came from like a background where things were quite structured and you were quite careful and a normal upbringing really you know you don't put yourself in vulnerable situations and and things like that and all of a sudden i'm seeing these people really like pushing the boundaries of what's acceptable and me going we can do that and look, you know, they're in a high flying executive position, a lot of them, and they were really pushing the boundaries. And that was a complete flip on anything that I'd ever experienced before, really. And I thought, do you know what? I have been careful and I have been, I don't want to say restrained because that's the wrong word really because my mum and dad didn't restrain me but they they made me aware that you know there were consequences to acting inappropriately I, sp I suppose and you don't want to go out and get absolutely hammered and you know you want to make sure you save a little bit of money and all of that you know that we want to teach our kids isn't it you know that's not a that's nowhere near a negative i would never put a negative spin on what they were doing they were just making me think about what i was doing before i was doing it but these guys weren't thinking about that everything returned back to normal when you went to work on a monday morning nobody thought any different of anybody and that was really the start of it it opened my eyes i enjoyed it and it wasn't a negative part of my life at all. In fact, I think it helped shape me to be who I am today, really, because, you know, I probably was quite sheltered before. And then all of a sudden, seeing that was, was like I say, just a complete eye-opener. And then about in 2008, I um, met my now husband, and he's a chef and I met him in Hotel de Van where we worked and obviously when we started going out that kind of reinforced what I'd learned over these few years of corporate hospitality because in a way he was in the same industry so it's all about food all about wine all about networking all about parties and that continued and that reaffirmation of yeah you know what you were doing before 
that kind of continues in this world really so we would when we started I suppose dating he'd have a few nights off a week and I would travel down to see him and stop over and it was all about the food and the wine and we had a great time and we did actually have an absolutely great time I felt safe obviously with him and a couple of years later we started living together and that date night of yes we're seeing each other so we're going to have a nice meal and we're going to have a bottle of wine turned into well we live together and there's a bottle of wine in the fridge and before I knew it I think that oh well you're having a date tonight so you're having a drink turned into oh I mix at work tonight but I'm still going to have a glass of wine and that's how it continued really for quite some time I didn't obviously uh, I wouldn't say I was heavily, heavily drinking. I think my tolerance level at that time was certainly increasing. And I remember obviously falling pregnant with my lovely daughter and I didn't drink through my pregnancy. But the first night <laughs> when, I, when I found out I was pregnant and my husband came home and I told him, you know, you're going to be a dad. She was like, absolutely amazing news. And we sat on the sofa and I actually thought, oh, I can't have a glass of wine to celebrate. <laughs> it was like a bit weird, really. And I kind of didn't know what to do with myself. I remember that night vividly, actually. And I said to my husband, I think, uh, shall we go for a walk and uh, maybe call into my sisters and uh, maybe we'll break a little bit of news to her because I just didn't know what to do with myself which is bad really and during my pregnancy obviously I was completely and utterly over the moon to be pregnant and I remember feeling so well during my pregnancy you know, when people say, oh, you're glowing, I really felt like I was glowing inside and out. I absolutely loved being pregnant and I felt so healthy and we went for so many meals and so had such a good time. And I felt so together during that time. And it's only since really I've looked back at that and I just thought, obviously, it was all about elation, seeing through things through rose-tinted glasses because I was so happy to be pregnant. But I actually think now it was like the pink cloud and it was the benefits of sobriety. I wanted to be pregnant and I was happy to be pregnant. But I think the health benefits actually were the fact that I wasn't drinking, but I didn't marry the two up at the time at all it's only since looking back at that time that i realized that it was because i wasn't drinking and then after my daughter was born i didn't drink huge amounts afterwards but i think within sort of six to nine months I'd gone back to normal kind of consumption and I would say normal kind of consumption at that point would be just under a bottle of wine most nights. I wouldn't say every night then but, but sort of most nights and that significantly increased over time. And I remember, and I, I still think about it in my little, let's call it a little regret cupboard really, I would sit every night and read a story to my daughter until she fell asleep with a glass of wine in my hand. And sometimes I would ask my husband to go and get me, to top me up because I had run out of wine during reading her story. And when I look back at that now, I am so, so grateful 
that I no longer do that. I don't know if she remembers, but I certainly remember. And I think I would still be doing that to this day if I hadn't have stopped, obviously. But that's quite a, a scary thought, really. And I think I started to acknowledge that there were issues, really. I would say that this is, we're going on to about... 2019 at this point it had definitely increased I'd had kind of internal conversations with myself about how much I was drinking certainly having some mornings whereby I knew that I wanted not to drink that day and the same situation you turn five o'clock and you'd be feeling better so you'd justify to yourself about having a drink that was about 2019 that those kind of conversations started really um and i tried i did try i'd I'd had a few breaks um there'd been a couple of incidents where i'd really overdrank i was realising that this is actually taking a bit of hold of my life in a negative way. So I'll just go through a couple of incidences. So one morning walking back from the school run and obviously had too much to drink the night before, walking home and the pavement just felt like it was bouncing. And I'm just like, this is a Monday morning you know, I've had the whole weekend where you should be rested, recovered, and actually I'm starting my week with hurriedly getting my daughters to school. Have I got all my ducks in order? Did I put everything in the lunchbox correctly? There would be times I've forgotten something, I can take it to school. But when I look now at how super organised I am and how I'm trying to get her to organise herself, you know, the night before, have you got your glasses? Have you got, is it flute tomorrow? What are you going to need to wear? Let's put it out. You know, that did not exist at that point. My routine now, my daily routine is so completely different to how it was because if you're not drinking and in the land of I don't care you're in the land of recovery and the land of recovery is I can't be asked and I absolutely even to this day I had Covid um, a few weeks ago and I felt myself getting angry at myself because I couldn't be bothered because obviously I I was poorly and when I feel that feeling now I have to remind myself it's not your fault you're not recovering from something that you have done to yourself you are recovering from being poorly and that's okay and you can't be angry at that but when I was recovering from a hangover when I well, when I was in full hangover mode, I was really angry at myself because yet again, I'd put myself in that position. I never hid anything from Nick, ever. I never hid how much I drank. The only thing I probably hid from him was how much it was affecting me. And since being sober, he knows how much it was affecting me. And I think he was he's really, really shocked at how it was affecting me. So I just carried on if somebody thinks that you know a highly functioning problem drinker is somebody that is weak-willed and have no mental strength they couldn't be further away from the truth because the mental strength that we need to get through those kind of days take something else to function and do everything that you need to do and i mean that's hard enough we know that being sober but doing that and recovering at the same time i mean i've joked these past couple of weeks because obviously there's coughs and colds going around 
and I've had the same coughs and colds as like my, my sister and my husband and it's completely floored them and I've got up and gone to work and been absolutely fine and I know it sounds crazy but I am convinced that it is the inner strength that I found whilst recovering from alcohol that is the same inner strength that I've got now to get me through the day and you just apply the same logic really um so that's where I was at not at any point did I ever consider being sober even though I was going through all of that never did it ever cross my mind that one day if you'd have told if you if I could reverse back in time and tell myself myself at that point there would come a time that you would be sober I never thought that that was going to be the case I only ever thought I will learn to moderate one day because I did really enjoy a drink I thought one day something will happen that will allow me to moderate which leads really really nicely to the start of my sobriety really which out of the blue one day myself and Ruth went for a walk socially distance walk may I add because we were in the middle of Covid and I rocked up hanging nothing unusual with that I was just hanging so you know another tough day of trudging through some mud that is recovery she was absolutely bouncing off the walls <laughs> <laughs> she was so so happy she'd been sober this was in the february she'd been sober from the um december and it was an absolute joy to see if not slightly annoying that she was so so bouncy and happy and we were just going through our what was going on in our lives at the time and she booking holidays and booking to do triathlons and I was in absolute awe she looked amazing skin was great and I was a bit shocked that she was still sober to be perfectly honest and that's only because of having bouts of sobriety beforehand my assumption obviously wrongly was that she was going to go back to drinking but this time something seemed different there was more of a resolute it was more of a definite it was more of a, a long-term situation and again a bit dubious of that because of you know we should never judge on past experiences versus what's going to happen in the future but that that's where I was at I was thinking oh she might go back to it but she didn't seem that way and I remember saying oh you know that's so awesome really really well done for you and she says but you could do the same and I said don't be silly I said you know me and a glass of wine that's never gonna happen and we kind of um didn't say much more actually and that day without anything before or anything after she just texts me a load of podcasts a load of audio books <clears throat> and I started listening to them I didn't tell anybody I just started listening to them sometimes even listening to them in the garden on a sun lounger with a glass of wine no doubt but I think things started resonating with me just snippets of podcasts that were staying with me snippets of audiobooks that were staying with me and it was like unpeeling that kind of onion really and it, with each layer I was realizing that there is another way and almost the ridiculousness of what we are doing to ourselves and there was one book in particular that just his use of sarcasm and irony just really resonated with me you know we got an alien out of space and explained to him what we start doing to ourselves on a friday and saturday night and why we're consuming it and 
they would look at you as if you've gone absolutely crazy and that's where I was starting to start thinking oh okay this is something and I never still at this point still at this point I was never thinking that one day I was going to be sober I was just thinking this is going to help me moderate or just drink occasionally I was not thinking of sobriety at all but these sayings and these kind of like snippets just kept rolling over in my head over and over again and I kept thinking yeah there is absolutely something in this and obviously with me still being sober and we were having conversations and so one day just out of the blue I woke up and in Manchester and I'd spoken to my sister-in-law about reading these couple of books and I was going through what I'd sort of learned and later on that evening my husband was talking about um, you know leaving one car here and driving to this other place and uh, all in aid all in aid of four adults being able to have a drink and it would also mean my daughter having to get in a taxi well us all getting in a taxi with my daughter and driving home and me being unable to drive her home and I just thought what are we doing to go to those lengths just so that we can have a drink and I just said I'll just drive tonight don't worry about it and my husband turned around and looked at me like I'd gone a little bit crazy I don't think he ever <laughs> expected those words to come out of my mouth but I just drove and I said oh if I want a drink I'll have one when I get home and I still didn't know if I was going to have a drink when I got home it was that unpremeditated and I put my little girl to bed and I walked down the stairs and he said do you want a drink and I could have so easily have said yes and I just said no I'm okay thank you and again he was a little bit shocked and he was like okay he said but you're not drinking tomorrow because I was at a party that I was driving to which again was very unusual and I thought if I can do these two days I've got two days of sobriety under my belt. If I can just do these two days, that's that's really good going. That's what I did. And the party, which was a Hindu, was a bit of an eye-opener. There was 50-year-old women dancing on tables that looked like they were going to collapse. And I was the person that was taking them off these tables. Had I have been drinking, I'd have been the person on the tables with them probably helping it collapse so that was a little bit of an eye-opener to say the least and then the next day I just tried not to drink and I applied that logic for the next few days and not once not once did I ever think that I was going to stop drinking completely and still to this day I have never said I'm never going to drink again and I think that is a real key to why I'm two and a half years sober because I've never put any pressure on myself and I always say to people you know it was just a molehill that I had to climb every day sometimes it didn't even feel like a climb to be honest it was just an acceptance but I think if I'd have looked and said to myself, I am never going to drink again, it would have been a mountain to climb. And now I realise that I didn't need to climb that mountain because I was only ever going to achieve it on my deathbed. Whereas now I achieve something every day by not drinking. And I think that was the biggest method that I could that, and the best way to do it for me really and I remember you know it was, it was um, June that I stopped drinking June the 4th 2021 and my birthday's in July and my husband said to me are you going to drink on your birthday I remember thinking I don't want to drink on my birthday but I didn't know if I was going to or not and I didn't, and that was all I did, was just put one foot in front of the other until 
my sobriety started really meaning something to me. And when I say really meaning, I feel like I completely own it. Like it's like a possession that I own. So sometimes people will say to me, do you ever fancy a drink or would you ever have a drink? Or we could have a Baileys at Christmas if you really fancied it. And to me, giving away my sobriety, for not that I ever would now, I don't, you know, well, he's never say never, but I can't ever see me giving up that just for a drink just is inconceivable for, to me now and I think I was starting to feel better the benefits of not drinking were starting to outweigh the what I perceived of the positives of drinking and that balance tipping from one way to another was a real pinnacle point really and I know we're going to try and do some future episodes on first few months of sobriety but you know my legs every day were aching um you know I'd walk into work and I felt like I'd got lead weights hanging off my legs and all of a sudden that was just starting to go. Um, I'd kind of started having some pains in my kidneys, which was obviously a real worry. And even though I was having these pains, obviously I didn't go to the doctors because I knew what they were going to say. And they started to alleviate. Just being tired all the time and suddenly I was getting my full eight hours a day and everything just seemed to be to just be getting easier and I started liking it (laughs) and more than importantly I started liking myself a little bit more as well I started that fire in my belly that I've always had of what I believe is right and wrong you know that kind of got relit really because during the times where I was drinking everything kind of like got a little bit fuzzy around the edges and I can't be bothered to fight for that because it doesn't really matter anyway you know just have another glass of wine and it won't matter you know all of a sudden those things started to matter to me again and it was months of realising actually the old me (laughs) The me that I remember from like my early 20s is coming back to life and coming back to a life with a vengeance, you know. People have said to me since, you don't mess with Claire because she's so crystal clear with everything now. You know, there isn't any fuzzy edges anymore. You see everything so clearly. Um, And I think I've always been that person you know, rightly or wrongly, it's just part of my personality that, you know, feels quite strongly about things. And all of a sudden, I was feeling strongly again about these things rather than not being bothered. And I had to kind of channel that. And as you obviously, as we all get older, you know, we learn to to pick our battles. But that fire in my belly had kind of come back, really. And just as a bit of a side note, just going back to the start of my sobriety that happened in the June but in the March beforehand unfortunately we lost my mother-in-law which is obviously a major thing to me and my family and she was the kind of like she was a Marks and Spencer's lady shall we say just to paint a picture of her she got up every morning regardless of the weather at seven o'clock and did a big walk you know she's in her 60s going into her 70s and she um was constantly on a diet constantly watching her weight um she had a drink but she moderated definitely moderated she had the art of moderation and she would make it quite clear because the other members of the family would over drink obviously myself included and she would make it quite clear 
that she didn't like us over drinking and that's how she lived her life she was really healthy the cancer that she died from was a cancer that's usually found in males that overeat and over drink drank so she should never have died from that cancer it was you know against all odds really and I think some people could look at that and say to themselves well you could if her odds are like that, you might as well just carry on because she tried and it didn't work for her. Whereas I looked at that situation and I thought to myself, if those are my odds, if I've got the same odds as her, then I want to be lying on my deathbed knowing that I didn't put myself there. And the way that I was drinking, I couldn't have said that to myself. I couldn't have said, actually, I've done everything in my power so that I am not in this position. And when you sat there looking around at your family, you don't want to be in that position. And I'm so grateful now that I have managed to pull myself out of that and that I can say that. Yes, I have the odd chocolate bar and I, yes, I don't, I don't exercise as much, but I am certainly not putting what I was into my body and I'm making sure that I can be as healthy as I can possibly be. And I say it to my daughter every day. I say, you know, the only thing that we actually own on this planet is our bodies that are transporting us around nothing else will matter the houses that we're living in you know the cars that we drive in you know you don't actually physically you don't own them they're not ours the only thing you own is that body because it's the only thing that we're coming and out of this world in and to, so for me yes you know i could definitely do we losing a little bit of weight and i'd love to be do a bit more exercise and all of that stuff we try hard every day don't we to do those things but i think taking booze out of the equation for me was the best thing that i could have ever done for myself thank you for listening to this episode of fizz free from ruth claire and jane if you'd like to get in touch with the show, the email is fizzfreezero at gmail.com. You can also find us online at Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Don't forget to follow the show and please give us a great rating to help spread the word. Fizz Free, your relationship with alcohol. Less fizz, more free.